I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Think like a Nobel Prize winner. Brian Keating, who you've probably listened to before on this podcast, he's interviewed a dozen or so Nobel Prize winners, and he wrote a book about what he learned from them. How can we start thinking the way Nobel Prize winners think? And I actually, first off, a lot of them have imposter syndrome. I didn't know that. But now I have imposter syndrome because I wrote the forward to the book. Or as always, a great conversation with Brian where I learned so much and heard so many interesting stories, particularly about what wasn't included in some of these interviews. So here it is. Brian, think like a Nobel Prize winner. I really, first off, I read it twice because I read it when I wrote the forward. Thank you very much yep. for asking me to write yes. the forward. Talk about imposter syndrome, which is something many of these Nobel Prize winners seem to experience. I definitely had imposter syndrome writing a forward for a book called Think Like a Nobel Prize Winner. And well, I, I, yeah, as I say, you know, just because you have imposter syndrome doesn't necessarily mean you're not a total fraud. Uh, so. Right. It could be, it could be you have imposter syndrome because you really know you're an imposter. So that's right. Yeah. It could be totally accurate. But what was so surprising to me uh, you know, thinking about it was, hey, I've looked up, you know, I've had my issues with the Nobel Prize, as you know, but never with the winners. You know, it's not like the winners literally cannot choose themselves, as we spoke about when you were on my podcast over a year ago. Uh, they can't choose themselves. Like, that was the one instruction that I got when nominating Nobel Prize winners in 2015 was I could not nominate myself. And that was basically the only thing that they adhered to from Alfred Nobel's will. So they couldn't choose yourself. So they got there. Someone else must have chosen them. And I've never had problems with the people that want it, but the process, I think, is very corrupt. You've had my friend Uni Turatini on, who wrote uh, Betraying the Nobel. Yeah, uh, she, so, she focused on the Nobel Peace Prize, which is really enlightening the way some of those people were selected. But, you know, I think what with physics, you uh, so th think like a Nobel Prize winner. I described it in the intro, um, which I'll say after this podcast. But uh, you focus on, I think, I, th I always think of physics and the Peace Prize, maybe the writing prize as kind of the, the most known Nobel prizes. But I always think of physics as the smartest Nobel prize. This is the one that rewards intelligence. These are people who are not just producing something uh, good, 
like the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize in Literature, they're discovering something completely new. And you interviewed, you know, all of these Nobel Prize winners in physics who they won the Nobel Prize ranging over the decades. So you write about how, what, what do they have in common? Your takeaways, what are, what could the readers or listeners takeaways be? And one, there's several themes through it, but the first is you talk a lot about imposter syndrome in this book and you yeah. find, and, and, but also there was other things I picked up too. Some had no self-confidence, some had a lot of self-confidence and some criticizing others said they were too, they weren't self-critical enough. So what's the story? Is there a real common thread? Did they all have imposter syndrome, but also a lot of confidence? What's the story? Yeah, according to themselves, you know, seven out of the nine that I interviewed, and since then I've interviewed another Nobel Prize winner that'll be in volume two. So get your typing hands ready for four. Well, I haven't won it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that about, uh, about the literature prize. Uh, there was a Japanese Nobel Prize uh, literature prize winner in 1995 who uh, was recently saying that, you know, when he won the Nobel Prize, he said to his mother, see, mom, I said uh, I would win the Nobel Prize as a kid. Uh, and I did it. I just won the Nobel Prize in literature. And this is in 1995. And she said, yeah, but you promised me it would be in physics. So even in the, even these, like the categories that you exalt so much, there is this kind of, yeah, even the, he must've felt like an imposter because it's not, you know, quote, a quote, you know, and what would he, what would an economics prize? Remember that prize was changed. The name was changed from the Nobel Prize in economics by dint of a lawsuit and legal wranglings between Alfred Nobel's you know, next of kin, he had no uh, direct heir, no children of his own, but his brothers had children. And uh, they made them change it to the very winsome and, and beautiful name, the Swedish Central Bank Prize in honor of the memory of Alfred Nobel. So that's that's the actual economics prize. Wow, so, so can you say, if you win that prize now, can you say you won the Nobel Prize? Well, look at, you know, Paul Krugman's bio and Twitter and you'll you'll get your answer there. Yeah, they, they yeah, always I'm sure say. he says he won the Nobel Prize. I'm not even, I don't even yes. have to look. <laughs> exactly. So uh, for, for those reasons, yeah, there is this, this recurring theme. It's not in all of them. Uh, but what's interesting, and they all think about it, even the ones that don't claim not to have the, the imposter syndrome all felt it. And that was really, you know, when you start writing a book, you never know where it's going to go on a good day, you know, but let alone like kind of in the middle. And then you're like, wow, I, this is like the third or fourth person to mention the, the imposter syndrome. And really for me, it hit home as I mentioned, by your co-laureate uh, who wrote the co-forward with you, uh, Dr. Barry Barish, uh, formerly of Great Caltech. Chapter now, in the book. Yeah, so he is uh, he's a phenomenal uh, individual, kind of like, I call him my avuncular avatar because he's uh, he's really what I aspired to be in many ways. But I, I he think told even me, using the word avuncular starts to qualify you for the Nobel Prize, but, but go ahead. <laughs> well, it's funny because this guy that I want to introduce you to, uh, eventually my friend David Perel, runs a very, very successful online writing course and this building a second brain project he's involved with. Um, anyway, he he has a video with this uh, other guy, Ali Abdal, and they talk about like words that people know and use, words that people don't know but use, words that people use and don't know, and then words that people don't use and don't know. And he's like, you could describe our relationship as, you know, as, you know, funny or hilarious, but you would never call it risible. And I'm always like, I, I want to, I want to aim for that vibe. I want to aim for the risible vibe that, what does that risible nobody mean? ever. It means like laughable or hilarious, but usually in a derogatory sense. He's, he's but anyway, risible. yeah. So I'm using a vuncular. You're, you're you're putting him down if you say, "Oh, he's he's too risable." He's well, I'm having on a very controversial guest this week, who's you know advocating along with his wife. Uh, this is Brett Weinstein for a change. I get the other half of the Weinstein uh, clan is showing up on my podcast, talking about their you know novel approaches to COVID, et cetera. That'll be out hopefully by the time people listen to this. Oh yeah, that but, sounds interesting. I, you know, he was, but he was uh, arguing for ivermectin. I remember there was a, right. a Facebook yeah. thread I was in that that um, he was he people were I think it was on Quillette actually. People were very yeah. upset at him. And they were shutting down his YouTube channel or demonetizing it. And since he got fired from Evergreen State University for not participating in the Whites Leave Campus movement a couple of years ago, he and his wife were basically fired, even though they had tenure. Um, you know, his income stream was severely reduced, to say the least. So he is not a professor anymore. And you know how lucrative that is. So, yeah, he has his pot. So that when they threatened to demonetize his YouTube channel, it was pretty controversial. Anyway, um, getting back to the imposter syndrome, I mean, the reason that really spoke to me with Barry 
is that he said the imposter syndrome got worse after he won the Nobel Prize. In other words, like we all have a basal, a threshold level of imposter syndrome. If you're like, if you're not a total, um, you know, kind of narcissist. And uh, what really revealed to me, since he had it more, I said, it's kind of unusual, James, that the opposite of something is the same as that thing. In other words, like if you're, what's the opposite of jealousy? Like if I'm jealous of your success, you're in the top zero, I, I checked, you're in the top 0.01% of all podcasts worldwide. And yeah, that's good I, to I'm, know. I'm, I'm not jealous of you. I would like to be, you know, kind of within a factor of, you know, a, a million of, no, no, I, I'll get there someday. But, but, um, but, you know, I'm not jealous of you. What's the opposite of je- Like, I'm happy for you. I, I feel, you uh, know, there is a There is a word. There's a uh, mit Freud. Which is oh happy, yeah, as opposed to Schadenfreude. Yeah. Which Schadenfreude is, uh, is the opposite. That's yeah, you're right. happy for someone's failure, probably because you're jealous of them, so you're happy for their failure. And and admit Freud is you're happy for someone's success. And um, this was in Robert Greene's book, uh, the the influence or laws no, the of power. laws of uh, uh, nature, the laws of human nature. And oh, okay. uh, you know, he recommends people should practice admit Freud, mm-hmm. but. And I agree. And and actually this guy, so so just to close, sorry to close the loop, the, the opposite of the, so imposter syndrome is based on insecurity and adequacy and, um, and fear of being discovered as a charlatan or, or not fitting in. Um, obviously I've mastered and overcome those fears. But, um, but the opposite of that is arrogance, right? It's like, um, which also stems from insecurity, inadequacy. Uh, so in other words, the root cause for both of these psychological phenomena, imposter syndrome on one hand, narcissistic arrogance on another hand, they stem from insecurity. So I found that very interesting because uh, you don't normally see that. Like you said, mid-Freud and Schadenfreud, they're stemming from two different psychological compulsions. One, uh, you know, envy and, 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 and wishing harm essentially and taking pleasure in someone's uh, di- this uh, favor. And then the other one is it's totally opposite. And yet these two emotions, imposter syndrome and arrogance, uh, they come from the same root emotion. Yeah, and it's it's so interesting because first, I think all of these Nobel Prize winners who think that they're that, who experience imposter syndrome, so they they're accepting the Nobel Prize and they're probably thinking of the historical significance of this. You know, Einstein won, and you know yes. all these great minds won, and I think they're probably right. Actually, like I mm-hmm. I, I think our reaction when we, when we hear someone has imposter syndrome is to think, oh, that's crazy. They just won the Nobel Prize. They're not imposters. They 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 deserve. I think they're actually right. Like they 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 you know they for for most of their lives they revered, for instance, Einstein or Marie Curie or whoever, mm-hmm. and and their their accomplishments probably seem to them insignificant to the theory of relativity and E equals M C squared. It's interesting. Do you know that Einstein thought almost every one of his uh, thoughts about his own theories was either wrong or not proven in his lifetime, or he thought was irrelevant and insignificant. In other words, there were only two things that were that saw confirmation during his lifetime. And he wasn't known for uh, insecurity, by the way. He used to say, once one of these theories was confirmed, the theory of general relativity, via the famous eclipse of 1919, um, that you and I witnessed um, back way back when, that uh, that he, if, if the reporter asked him, what if the results of the observation were not consistent with your theory of relativity. And he said, then I would have felt sorry for the good Lord because my equations are correct. So he had no uh, imposter syndrome that we know about, except that he was in awe of Isaac Newton, who, as I point out, when Barry told me, Barry Barish, winner of the 2017 Nobel Prize, who really inspired me to start asking questions about the imposter syndrome, he told me that he had the imposter syndrome when he saw Einstein's name in this logbook that he had to accept the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, when he accepts it from the King of Sweden, you have to sign. I got my chunk of gold. I got my share of the $1 million prize purse, et cetera. I got my portrait. Um, and he said, I've had such imposter syndrome never before and, and only since then it has gotten worse. And I said, Einstein felt the imposter syndrome about Isaac Newton calling him the greatest contributor, not only to science, but to Western thought. Not, not, <laughs> in other words, he, and it's true, by the way, Newton influenced Thomas Jefferson in the writing of the Constitution, as a Jay knows uh, from his uh, studies <laughs> of the Constitution. And then lastly, as I said to him, Wait, how did, how, did, how did Newton uh, influence Jefferson? I didn't know that. So he used Principia. The Principia were the principles of mathematical um, and physical logic. Mm-hmm. So the laws of, you know, of, of all of um, what we call mechanics and, and aspects of calculus, et cetera, et cetera. And those would, were predicated on axioms that were 
um, that were going back to the to the ancient Greeks uh, were sound. They would say things like such and such is self evident. So they would say that two parallel mm -hmm. lines, James, ne that pass through two different points, um, they never meet. That was claimed to be self evident because of course they don't. Uh, that that the angles interior to a triangle all sum up to 180 degrees. That was considered to be self evident or could be proven. Now, by the way, those aren't true. They're only true in flat, what's called flat space. But as you know from losing the Nobel Prize, the universe could be flat, it could be curved like a basketball, it could be curved like a Pringle chip, it could have all these different uh, geometries. And so it's not true that parallel lines never meet. They meet on the surface of a sphere, they don't meet on the surface of a piece of paper. So Newton used those same terminologies, including the notion of self-evidentiary proof. And then obviously, what is the first line of the Declaration of Independence? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know. Um, uh, and he knew Euclid, and he knew Newton, and he wasn't that much older than him, right? Or younger than Newton. Right, and I guess then you're right. So, Declaration of Independence sort of starts with a, essentially a set of axioms as he makes the proof that there's a better way to live than being indentured to England. But I don't really think Einstein had imposter syndrome. I don't think he got the Nobel Prize and walked around. Like I think part of imposter syndrome is not only feeling like you got something or you're someplace where you don't deserve to be, but I think it's also a fear that everyone else feels the same way that you do. Isaac Newton also claimed the imposter syndrome, but it kind of dovetails in what you just said, but he felt that he was inadequate compared to Jesus Christ, <laughs> um, who he said that he failed to live up to except in one respect, which is that he died a virgin. Isaac Newton died a virgin, and he claimed that was his greatest accomplishment because that was the most Christ-like that he could be. Um, so. Now, he's also famous for this phrase I'm sure you've heard, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. So he said, if I have seen farther than others, it is only because I stood on the shoulders of giants, which sounds really cool, right? Um, but uh, on the other hand, he was partially, they think that he was partially uh, um, burning or roasting one of his enemies. He was a very vindictive person, apparently. Um, he spent a lot of time thinking about how to torture counterfeiters and and do all sorts of alchemy. Well, he had, a, he had a vicious battle with uh, Leibniz as who, Leibniz, as yeah. who invented uh, uh, calculus. Calculus, that's right. And uh, but so and I think Leibniz was short, and so he was making like a play at his expense that like uh, I looked over the shoulders of little people. In other words, that's why I saw so far. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it could have been like false humility because like didn't the other people stand on the shoulders of giants too? And anyway, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, you might be right because like we all, just as he stood on the shoulders of giants, um, so ev everyone can stand on the shoulders of giants, right? There's nothing unique about standing on the shoulders of So it's kind of deflecting a compliment in a sense that maybe wouldn't be so genuine. I mean, hopefully he won't retaliate Isaac Newton uh, against us. But, uh, but the point being, that uh, you know, I wanted to write the book because so many of my students and postdocs and just people I know, if you look around anywhere on the internet, like I would say right now, for some reason, the zeitgeist is full of examples of the imposter syndrome where people don't feel like they deserve a certain number of followers or, or creators or like they do things to get followers and then they get them and they don't feel they deserve it because the way they got it and blah, blah, blah. And again, uh, most of those people who, who do feel that way deserve to feel that way. I will mm -hmm. say every time I have felt imposter syndrome and it's been often, mm -hmm. I was an imposter. <laughs> like mm. I just, it was justified. Yeah. And I think you, you don't really know if you're an imposter or not until much later, because think of, yeah. think of like legacy. You don't really know what your legacy is until after you die, but you're dead. So right. like, like Einstein has this huge legacy and a lot of the things he did has had ramifications over the decades. He lived to see a lot of the ramifications, but you know, some people do, some people don't. Some of these people who won in the Nobel Prize in your book won for very esoteric theoretical things, and you and you have to yeah. question. Okay, yes, what they did was clearly the cutting edge on understanding how the universe began, what the universe is made of, how the universe works. But in terms Those are of easy to understand things, so the, the ones that are hard are topological states of matter that only exist in two dimensions. Yeah, instead so, of three some of those people though are involved in in that stuff. I didn't understand what, what most of these people did. They have to question they bring this up in your book in some cases, yeah. you know, you don't, you can't really think about the outcomes. You can't think about whether it's practical or how important this is. You have to do what you love. You have to do what you're curious about. You know, we can talk about the do what you love part. My sense exactly. is they really loved doing what, what they do, but mm -hmm. some of these things, again, even one person, I forget which one said, you can't focus on whether it's practical or not. You just have to, you have to do the work. Yeah. 
And Sheldon Glashow called it, you know, the importance of doing useless research. And he had this incredibly esoteric. And by the way, it's not a science book, as you know. Neither was my first book. These are the first book was a memoir, and the second book's more of a self. It's actually in self help. The, yeah, no, this is insanely readable, and it is self help. It actually, you know, we were talking earlier about Robert Greene's books. It, it reminds me of those a little bit, and that those are so filled with stories of historical people and, and the lessons mm -hmm. you can learn from them. But these are people you spoke to who are yeah. alive, who are among the smartest people on the planet as denoted by, you know, winning the Nobel prize in physics. And when they talk, they're not, talk, they're not giving a physics lesson. I would say a central theme of the book is curiosity. And this is like yeah. almost like a guide into what the most curious people in the world are like and how you can sort of cultivate th that kind of curiosity in yourself, because that does they all attribute their success to curiosity but the, yeah. the imposter syndrome made me think though and we'll talk about curiosity in a second and the methods they use and you use to to cultivate it but how many of them do you think are depressed or anxious and the reason mm -hmm. i ask is because when you have a goal like you know figuring out how the universe was born <laughs> that's on the one hand that's a an, an as you put it even possibly an arrogant kind of goal like to think that you could even come close to such a, an answer to such a question and right. and and yet if you know there's so much competition in science and academia for the nobel prize for you know for money and and monetary prizes and funding and so on there must be an incredible amount of anxiety around that they have around the research they do and and they don't know if they're going to succeed or fail they have no idea you could do a project right. for 20 years like you said with einstein it, what if he what if what if 13 years after he published his theory of relativity it, it, something disproved it that's anxiety producing yeah and especially one of the laureates frank wilczek is a extremely prolific author and wall street journal uh, contributor he had to wait 30 years between the theory that everybody told him would result in a nobel prize someday he had to wait his turn because it needed to be confirmed and replicated etc cetera, etc cetera. but this took an, a staggering amount of time to get replicated or to get um the the preceding awards to be won and it made me think of these guys that want to live forever you know with life extension prominent in the news now and my doctor's you know phone call notwithstanding just a couple minutes ago uh, you know people want to live to 150 and uh you know and whatever so you and i can live 100 more years hopefully but um but then there's first of all there are questions about you know there'll be disparities in wealth because only the rich people like plasma tvs when they came out could be afforded by rich people only and so what about us common people etc cetera, etc cetera. and then there would be you know kind of concerns about well if natural causes of death come off the table then only you have to worry about like being killed in an accident and or being killed by a fellow human being which like, is being now murdered. been solved by COVID because we all just stay indoors jay hasn't left his house <laughs> in a year and a half i know i saw his fingernails i don't know how he texts me all the time with his <laughs> fingernails and the tissue box is on his feet but thinking about that for a guy who had to wait 30 years to guarantee imagine if you knew you'd win the nobel prize like in other words he knew he would win the nobel prize it was a, it was a foregone conclusion just like with the higgs boson it's, uh, there's no way the universe could have been structured otherwise waiting 40 50 60 years you know whatever how do you know you're going to live that long imagine the anxiety that would produce so that was one interesting thing and uh, by the way i should say that you know for james altucher show listeners this week i want to i don't want i didn't write this book uh, first of all you inspired me or goaded me however you, you want to say that it, in the write. acknowledgments but i think you ha you had the book in you and i i appreciate you mentioning me in the acknowledgments you you this is a great book and 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 you know it was it was a really good job but but just like you wrote think like a billionaire which obviously inspired the title um and and guided me a lot of the you know kind of uh, early connective tissue of the book um in kind of this brand that i'm cultivating whatever it's not like you read think like a billionaire you'll become a billionaire but you think like a billionaire and anybody can think like a billionaire it costs nothing to think like a billionaire it costs nothing to think like a nobel prize winner and so much so that i wanted to reduce the price as much as possible so the ebook is only 99 cents this this week you know as the launch week we made the the ebook i don't care about making money i want this message to go out as you say curiosity inspiration collaboration 
overcoming anxiety, depression, all these things are on display. And the one thing this book isn't is a physics book. It's not, you know, there, there is a, you know, a couple chapters of equations, unremittent equations and homework assignments. But besides yeah. those, which you got a hundred percent on. Very impressive. People will think that's true, but it's, it's I not know, true. I'm just, I'm just telling everybody. There's no equation. I don't even think I have E equals MC squared in here, which is de rigueur for most uh, authors in science. But anyway, I wanted as many people, especially young people, because these people have tremendous knowledge as the Nobel Prize signifies, but do they have wisdom? I think wisdom is far more interesting than knowledge because Wikipedia has a lot more knowledge than any of these people or the whole of human species could ever have, but it has zero, absolutely zero wisdom. And actually, I don't think that that's as valuable. Like nowadays we're in a, we're in a current, like the currency of the new world is wisdom. It's not knowledge anymore because everyone is as kind of reached parity with wisdom, with knowledge. You can get as much knowledge as, as Elon Musk in a, in a nanosecond, but can you get as much wisdom as you know, these wise individuals can. And it's, it wasn't clear to me in the beginning that people who won the Nobel Prize would have any wisdom. In fact, one of them said, you know, if you think these guys are smart, just watch them on the, on the day of the ceremony trying to get their eggs at breakfast. Like, <laughs> you'll well, quickly be disabused that these are some, like, supernatural people. But in this case, I happened to find these nine special individuals that have a tremendous amount of wisdom. But it was my job to extricate that from there, because they don't think in those terms. They're much more technically savvy than I am. And but I think in terms of the soft skills that actually made them partially so successful. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main. That's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes. I'm trying. I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half, and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works travels and or cares about looking and feeling great as you could tell by my many photos across the internet i care about looking fantastic i'm practically a model and let's be honest every guy loves to look great so again shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20 percent when you spend 130 dollars or more using promo code james that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main dot com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests 
to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll sign up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever gonna make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. First off, I agree with you that knowledge and, and information it's just a commodity right now. Like it's, it's everywhere. You don't have to spend years learning it in school. The real, as you, as you, you put it as wisdom, I'm going to change the name a little bit and call it discovery. Mm -hmm. So having mm -hmm. an ability to discover what nobody else knows seems to be real wisdom because mm -hmm. breaking discovery down, you have to have an ability to go against the crowd because it's completely yeah. new and, and people will often contest you for even trying to find something new. Why don't you uh, uh, respect the established view of things? You have to have, uh, the, the skill set to, to, you know, you have to have the creativity to even wonder where there might be a new thing that exists. You have, you have to know what you don't know and know yeah. where it is to find, and then you have to go That's and find right. it and, and prove it. Like I think I, and I think all of these people almost by definition, they've discovered something completely new and it's a big risk. They could have been wrong. It, maybe, right. maybe they could have spent their whole lives thinking there was something new over here in this dusty little corner of the universe. And turns out there was nothing. And <laughs> that's right. Some people probably, that probably had, there's probably a whole list of people who that happened to, but these people, 
I don't say they're lucky. Clearly, they've used all their skills to. A lot of them credit luck. A lot of them credit luck with their success. Well, let me ask. Let me ask you this. So we've talked about Dunning Kruger bias before. It's the idea that when you start doing an activity, you have this cognitive bias where you think you're great at it. So yeah, maybe like I'm, the, I'm the world's leading expert <laughs> in the Dunning Kruger. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's like the, the, the classic example is in a survey, nine out of 10 people think they're an above average driver, <laughs> but really only four out of 10 could be. And right. I always say I'm the one out of 10 that knows he's a below average driver. That's why I don't even have a license. But uh, uh, I think Dunning-Kruger bias is a real powerful cognitive bias in a positive way because it keeps mm. you when everyone else is thinking, what's this guy trying to prove this theory? He's an idiot. He can't do that. Yeah. And, but he, that guy thinks he's smart enough to do it. So, cause of Dunning Kruger bias and, exactly. and it keeps you persevering until you do it. Like I, I've been writing, you know, books for, or, or other things for, for 30 years, I've been writing every single day. And for the first 10 years, I always thought from the beginning I was great, <laughs> but I now realize looking back at even stuff from a year ago, it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I'll think that a year a year from now about yeah, stuff right hope, now. Let's hope so. Yeah. Let's hope so. So so I think I think imposter syndrome and and anxiety, they're always used in a negative context, but I think these are very positive forces that that keep you that, that could keep you going and keep you motivated. You know, but that's why I was curious though, there is a negative side to it. Like how many of these people have suffered from depression? Yeah. No, I think I think there's a lot and I think part of it is yeah, it's it's a letdown, right? When you reach the promised land, you know, say say what you want about, you know, religion or whatever, but you know, Moses doesn't get into the promised land. It's a, it's a very powerful lesson, uh which is that, you know, we all will have things like you said, like things that were confirmed, like Einstein's uh, you know, one of his greatest accomplishments was the inclusivity of this term called the cosmological constant, which, you know, wasn't discovered until 1998. It'd be dead 45 years, you know, 40 years or something by that point. And, um, you know, and, and so these, th that nobody would have predicted that it revolutionized our understanding of what's going to happen in the far future of our universe, et cetera. And nobody could have predicted that uh, besides him, perhaps. And he actually thought it was a blunder, so he had some humility about it. Uh, but later it turned out his bl calling it a blunder was a blunder. Hmm. So only Einstein, you know, we say can make these mistakes. But on the other hand, um, you know, what if he had lived, you know, long enough to to witness that? I mean, would he have, like, overcome this this sort of, you know, whatever he, again, I don't, I agree with you. I don't think he was impeded in any way by a lack of, of confidence. So not everybody suffers from it. Like I said, two out of the nine claim that they don't in this book. And, and I think uh, those are instructive too. On the other hand, you ask a very good question. Now, obviously I'm not a psychologist. I will prescribe medicine. No, no, I won't prescribe medicine. But uh, I wish but, uh, you could. You know, I need I my, I need, there's a lot of medications I would get if I had free reign. Free, yes, exactly. All right. If you knew it would not affect you. If I knew a good term. corrupt doctor, but you're just That's a right, doctor yeah. of physics. <laughs> Contact him at his website. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, the T.S. Eliot said something that is apropos. It happens not to apply to these nine people, but he said, and he won the Nobel Prize in Literature, he wrote, uh, a Nobel Prize is a ticket to your funeral because no one ever does anything after he wins it. And obviously, you know, there are people that do stuff afterwards, but many of these people win it in their 90s or eight, late 80s, the average age, which is part of the reason I wanted to do the interview now, as soon as I got, you know, enough material and interviews and, and content edited it. Um, because I thought, you know, these guys are getting old and, uh, and the women won't talk to me. I tried to get the two living Nobel prize winning women and they both rejected me. So I took me back to high school, <laughs> which is good. No, I, I, I'm not going to let it. I, I hope. Why, why did I'll, they, I'll... why did they reject you? You think, I mean, first off people should know we, we, in order to get podcast guests, you have to ask 10 people for every one guest you get. So it's, it's yeah. not out of the ordinary that it, for think like a billionaire, it took a long time. I refused to write the book without a female voice. It took me a long yeah. Finally, Sarah Blakely and and I included Tyra Banks in there because her mm -hmm. franchise is a billion dollar franchise. But yeah, I, no, I, I wanted to, and I was I, I considered holding it up until I could get you know somebody to uh, a, a female voice because I think it is it is incredibly instructive. And by the way, about a third to a half of my graduate students are women. And I'm proud of that. And and I've had, you know, at least that many number, you know, of podcast guests be women. Uh, and it just, you know, I just couldn't, there are only two of them that are still alive. One has a policy that she doesn't do interviews because, you know, it's like, 
you know, she just wants to be fair and not give, you know, podcast to Brian Keating, but not to Joe, you know, James yeah. Altuch or whatever. So she doesn't want to have to think about like who she said yes to and who she said no to. And the other one is just like besieged because she won it only in 2020, less than a year ago now. Yeah, it's, and so uh, she's just like totally overwhelmed and swamped, and so she just can't do it. The, the uh, but, CRISPR, you know, the CRISPR woman, I would do that. Well, that was chemistry. That was Duda. Yeah, she won it, and I'm trying to get in touch with her, uh, you know, via back channels. And and um, you know, like I am serious. I am going to put out a second edition, you know, because I of course I think this eventually is a, this is the uh, uh, a topic that only only grows. But but I I do want to ask you like. Uh, well, no, no, now I'm forgetting what I wanted to ask. Actually, <laughs> well, about the depression, the anxiety, the the letdown that you must feel, and and yeah. because of that, I think it's true. If you do, you can use it one of two ways, as the Bible says, I put before you a double edged sword, blessing and curse. So it's a blessing on one hand, it's a curse on the other hand because they don't have any free time. The end of their productivity sometimes awaits. But these guys, in particular have been exceptionally adroit at getting in, in, involved and being elder statesmen, which has a negative effect, by the way. Well, well okay, so you, let, let me ask you a couple yeah. of things on this because this, yeah, yeah. this is a lot to unpack. First off, do you think it's really true that physicists, mathematicians, or, or maybe anybody do their best work in their 20s? As, as T.S. Eliot, T.S. Eliot's kind of suggesting that your best work is when you're young and that when you yeah. win the Nobel Prize, that not only is it, the highest honor, so you don't feel motivated to do more work, but you're also older, is what he's referring to. I don't think so. I, I think it, it can in mathematics. So my, my father was a mathematician, as you know, my late father. And uh, and it can in theoretical physics, which is as closely related to mathematics as almost anything. But it's definitely not true in experimental physics, which is you know why partially I thank God that I am an experimental physicist. Because we get better with age, like a fine wine. Uh, we get better because we add literal new tools to our toolkit. There's new technology being invented. Probably have a better sense of risk too. So experiments... Yes. are riskier than theorem proving <laughs> because you have to actually if, unless build you follow something. the skip the line rule unless you follow the skip the line rule and do as many cheap experiments as you can it's which true is what well that's how we do, that's right. how you but that's using an experimental approach to right. to determine what your big experiment should be you know what a cheap experiment is called? A theory. You know, it's like a, a string theory costs nothing to write a paper, but it could cost a trillion dollars to try to build an accelerator to smash atoms together to test if little strings pop out, right? So there's a high risk. You're absolutely right. And, and so for that reason, you have to get the low-hanging fruit has to be picked, you know, way well beforehand. So th for those reasons, you accrue just like, uh, would you rather go to the, you know, to the neurosurgeon, you know, resident on his first day or her first day out of, out of med school or, you know, the wise and old soul, you know, we're more like surgeons in that sense. So you built up like a huge repertoire of, of experiences, encounters, and, and, a, and a statistical distribution that's fascinating that can't be replicated when you're 20 years old. It just cannot be. So I think they're right about the very young uh, theorists. So, so why, why is that though about the very young? Is the mind set up so that it could calculate equations faster? Like what, what is going on in the young mind that may, or, or you just have more energy and, and, and this kind of work requires a lot of energy? It's not identical, but it has certain DNA in common with chess, does it not? I mean, there are chess masters that are older, but but for a long time it was a young person's game. And and I know you have on uh, the chess master, um, what do you call her? The grandmaster. Yeah. She she was just on. And by the uh, way, she but, she was the youngest grandmaster ever when she became a grandmaster. She beat right. Bobby so this, record. Yeah. But now but, it's but very I, theoretical. I don't, I, but I don't believe it though that young people. I think young people have a lot of time to pursue their interests and that's the thing they don't have a family, but I wonder if I'm just rationalizing and it re and the young brain really can memorize more, calculate more. We know with dementia, the older brain deteriorates, but right. like neuroplasticity, but like for instance, like, yeah. there's nobody in the top 100 in chess who's uh, over the age of 40 or maybe there's one person, but I wonder about this. I think that you need to do anything. Well, you could do it. I don't think there's any, exclusion principle that prevents that from happening at an older age, certainly not an experiment. Although you could argue, you know, it's sort of a clock that starts elapsing. So my father used to describe it as, as a clock that turns on, you only have about 10 years. So you could start that 10 year period at 30, at 40, at 50, potentially in chess or in uh, theoretical physics or in mathematics. But no matter what, it, it's just very hard to concentrate on one productive line of, you know, you can't pursue 80 different things. You can't be, you know, worrying about uh, extraneous things, just like writing. Like 
I heard something said by one of your guests and he doesn't have any kids. He said like, every kid you have is a book you don't write. And I'm like, that's horrible. Like, you know, James could have written five more books, you know, whatever. But, uh, <laughs> but the point being, how do you- uh, That, that how, assumes how that you... you're a good father. I don't know if yeah, I exactly, qualify. Right. Yeah, <laughs> no, your your kids are are incredibly uh, exceptionally accomplished, and and owes much to Robin. <laughs> but but the point being, if you have a period of time to think without ceasing, Isaac Newton again, uh, he was not a father because he died a virgin, right? Uh, so he he uh, that we know about. I mean, yeah, twenty three and me wasn't working back then, right? But he, uh, you know, he credited. Uh, they asked him, "How did you do what you did?" He's like, uh, "Because I thought about them without ceasing." Richard Feynman did a lot of his great work after his first beloved wife died and before he really became more interested in parenting. Albert Einstein was a terrible father. I mean, he he had one son who was committed to a sanatorium, never saw him after, you know, he was like 12 years old, uh, despite writing letters to him, whatever. He just didn't make time. It's not like he couldn't get on a plane and go to Europe and see his kid. Um, but So he never saw him. So I think, yeah, I would like to think that it's not because, only because you have things like kids and and family. Although you see with young women, you know, they are, if they do want to have families, it is incredibly challenging, a burden that we men don't have to deal with. I, you know, it's kind of like a woman tax in academia. It's just, it's hard to, you know, simultaneously give birth <laughs> and, uh, and then also, you know, continue a laboratory or a theoretical program with graduate students and postdocs that you have to fund. You know, it's not just like, oh, you've got free money raining down on you. Um, so I do think there are some aspects of it that's true, but is it correlative or causative? Uh, it could be a little of both. And, and, and I would say too, uh, you know, as a situation changes, you have to continuously focus on what's good. So for yeah. instance, let's just say hypothetically that, okay, you, you no longer have the brain that could calculate, you know, monster equations and prove them and this and that, well, maybe start switching over to experimental physics because, right. you know, you could be still great at that or, or, or writing about or physics teaching, you know, or writing, teaching yeah. or whatever. Yeah. There's another thing too I want to unpack on what you said earlier, and this is related to the depression and, and anxiety and imposter syndrome and so on. It's not fun doing this work. It, like right. you could love it and you could think this is the best thing ever. And this could, this could be the only thing you want to do in life, but it's, 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 it's hard. And you know, watching, I always say, and I, I probably say it too much on this podcast, but for me, watching TV is fun and makes me happy <laughs> and eating popcorn while I'm watching TV. Uh, is even, it's even funner. Better. And if I just wanted to be happy, <laughs> I would do that all the time. But instead I constantly yeah. set myself up for like these obnoxious challenges for myself, which are right. often things I want to do, but I'm miserable 50% of the time. Yeah. I mean, writing is, you know, what did Hemingway say? You know, it's very simple to be a writer, just sit down in a chair and bleed out on the typewriter. Yeah. Or, um, or stand up like, who, comedy. Who's going to volunteer to do it? Like, like, you know, trying to do stand up comedy for the past six or seven years. It's, sometimes it's great. And sometimes people are laughing at you and not with you. And yeah. So, right. You know, everything. So like, balancing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. So, so how do they, how, how do they, how does anybody justify like they, they, all these people, they're so smart. They could have gotten tenure easily, not pursue a Nobel prize. Like is something wrong with them that they then spent essentially an extra 20 years of energy going the extra lengths to, to be one of the few people who would ever win this. And James, by the way, we're saying this with uh, survivorship bias, at least yeah. in my case. So in other words, I've gotten tenured. I'm the chancellor's professor of physics here. You know, I've, I've gotten all the, 20 years ago, you know, like it was much, you know, n think about what's happening now when people see um, this, this thing where these people in their day and age, you know, some of these people got tenure at age, you know, 27. And, you know, I didn't get tenure until I was in my 30, early 30s. Um, you know, these, these, you know, it was different and it's getting worse. So I've had students quit recently and say, basically like, I don't want to be like you, dad, you know, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want, I've seen your life. I see how you like are in this constant struggle. You're like rarely in the laboratory with me working on stuff. And I feel guilty, Jay. It's like, you know, with your kids, I have to drive my kids to school. And I'm like, I kind of rationalize that that's parenting, you know, because we try to talk about like spiritual or philosoph philosophical things or even physics or, or even like driving or politics with my older kids um, and increasingly, you know, with the younger ones. But, but you know, is it really the same as like, you know, really quality time without my phone or not driving rather or whatever? No, it's probably not. But I do think about that, the guilt that I feel with my graduate students and postdocs because like the thing that got you into it, it's like sex. 
<laughs> they, you know, sex, the outcome of sex James produces children, which then prevents you from having sex ever again, right? So <laughs> it's, unless self, if you're, it's you know, a self-sabotaging. Unless you're, you know, Genghis Altucher over there. <laughs> but uh, but the but the point that I'm trying to make is, you know, the act of becoming a successful professor now means that you no longer have time to be a successful physicist. And and rarely do I get into the laboratory. You know, I do get satisfaction from meeting with my students who are then in the laboratory, but it's not the tinkering, it's not the playful attitude, which I think, you know, as, as Ray Weiss, who won the Nobel Prize alongside Gar Barry Barish in 2017 for LIGO, detecting two black holes colliding a billion light years away, um, uh, you know, with a vibration in their system at less than a billionth the diameter of a proton. I mean, this is a successful guy. He says, if it's not fun, get out of it. And you mentioned in, in the book a couple of times, uh, and and I think maybe it's just a matter of definitions, but you mentioned that passion is not important. And I kind of yeah. think passion is a little important, but there might be a cause versus correlation here in that mm -hmm. as you start succeeding at something that you're good at, you're going to feel more passion for it. And as opposed, you know, maybe there was an initial spark that got you going, but you know, to sit down and do something hard requires energy. And if you don't like it, then part of the, like, if you really don't have passion for it, part of the energy required to do something amazing is going to be spent uh, convincing yourself to just sit down yes. and do this. So you need some passion. Yeah, I have a mathematical explanation for that. So I think that passion in the beginning is like uh, is like the learning curve, the Dunning-Kruger curve, you know, where it's very steep in the beginning. It's very satisfying. You get a lot of, you know, kind of like, oh, I now know that, you know, you know George Washington, you know, had these different, you know, failings as a human being, you know, and like you learn all these things, but you don't learn a lot of nuance in the beginning. Uh, and then, so that curve is very steep and it's kind of, it's an exponentially rising curve that then saturates and gets flat or maybe peaks. And then, and then there's another curve called the forgetting curve, which is also exponential. So like when you learn something, uh, if you don't review it, that decay, your knowledge will decay over time. There's just other things are going into your brain and, and you're pushing out other things, as Homer Simpson said, every time I learn something, it pushes something else out of my brain. And uh, so you've got this exponential decay and this exponential growth. And what do you get when you multiply those two curves together? You get kind of like a bell-shaped curve where it rises steeply in the very beginning, kind of plateaus and then declines. So passion can get you started on the left side of that curve. But I think curiosity keeps you going and it gets you back to like every now and then the way to, to reestablish the forgetting curve and reset it back to the baseline when you knew something is to be cur like, why was this important? Why is this equation so fast? Why is this experiment? And that curiosity is not passion. It's actual curiosity for the, the thing that sets you out seeking in the very beginning. This, I think, is the, the, the fundamental thread. There's a lot of great threads running through this book, but everything... To, to me boils down to how these individuals cultivated such extreme curiosity. They're able to discover new things about the entire universe. And it's amazing. Yes. And, and so I want to, I want to break down what are the, there's, there's curiosity, but, but I don't believe there's such a thing as curiosity. These people all talk about it in different ways. So mm -hmm. what would, what are kind of the, um, what's the DNA or what's the, uh, the nucleus of, of, curiosity because th this is fundamental to this being a self-help book it's not only about persevering through a tough experiment it's about uh you know how they each develop curiosity like one mm -hmm. one quote i kept reading these different quotes and or your, your different takeaways and i kept thinking this sums up the book but i always i said that about almost every single quote so but but there was one thing that i really related to because it's true in almost every activity ask if there's a better way. And I forgot who said it, maybe Mathers or Weiss. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but he, he, he pointed out, ask if there's a better way. Now that's interesting. And for a couple of reasons, one is he doesn't say look for a better way. He said, ask if there's a better way. And I don't know if there's mm -hmm. a difference there. Do you think there's a difference there? Yeah. I think that there is a difference between asking and, and finding something. So all these projects start off as research. In other words, that they weren't known. The answer wasn't known ahead of time and that this could have been a wild goose chase. It could have been pointless. Some of these things are serendipitous. In oh, other words- Oh, oh and by, by the way, I, I wanna, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Brian, but I wanna explain, no, like ask if there's a better way in just real practical life. Like, let's say you wanna buy a car that is, you know, saves on gas and you find a Toyota Corolla, you know, asking if there's a better way means you do research on cars to see if there's a cheaper, a car out there that might be more effective at saving on fuel prices and 
and so on. So there's practical applications mm -hmm. to, to this question. And, and, uh, you know, so I just wanted to say that. Or in, yeah, yeah, in, no, in, ch in chess, my, my by the way, there's a saying: mm -hmm. if you find a good move, find a better move. So, right, uh, this applies to everything in life. It's such an important question. Aviation, yeah, aviation. Um, so sometimes, you know, as I, I talk about, you know, I fly a little, uh, little tiny Cessnas around, and and I started off trying to become a flight instructor while I was interviewing one of these laureates, and he's the one that focuses on debunking Malcolm Gladwell's, you know, er Anders Ericsson's 10,000 hour rule. He says it's total BS. And, and anyway, we go through it. And I say, you know, one point, first of all, one thing that really strikes me of that the difference between being a university professor and a flight instructor who like some 20 year old kid, or 18 year old kid could theoretically, I think, be a, a flight instructor is that it's the only place in the government handbook of regulations for, you know, certified uh, people, you know, in the IRS handbook, in the, you know, Department of Energy handbook, or whatever. they don't have like, your students or your your clients will need love, you know, they'll need because they actually show Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I was never taught that as a professor, <laughs> you know, Maslow's hierarchy of need, I was never taught how to be a teacher. And I think it's it's instructive to learn, you know, one of the lessons that that you learn from a flight instructor, if they're any good, is that you have to learn from the mistakes of others because you're not going to live long enough to make all of them yourself. And so I started to think, well, how can you apply that to physics? And and another lesson, you know, I think from aviation is, or not just physics, but to being a car salesman. Again, my avatar is not a physicist in this. It's like a car salesman in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It, it's, it should be applicable to anybody. Um, you know, sometimes the best uh, way home is, is to turn around. In other words, to like, just like you, you're flying into a thunderstorm or near the mountains or whatever, like sometimes your best option is just to stop. You know, I'd rather be on the ground wishing I was in the sky than in the sky wishing I was right. on the ground. And so the important thing about that is not only is it a life-saving way to mm -hmm. think, it's hard for people to take a step backwards. It's hard in anything in yes. life to say, okay, this is not working. I'm going to start all over. This flight, I really wanted to get from Santa Some Barbara cost. to Santa Monica, but I have to turn around. Yeah, right. Yeah. The sunken, sunken cost fallacy. That's a style of thinking that needs to be cultivated because, yes. you know, or like, let's say you're starting a business. It's really hard to say, listen, it's not, my business is not working out, or maybe I can right. change it to some other model. Like you'll fight to, to the death sometimes for your business. Yeah. Idea. I've seen entrepreneurs do it much to their detriment. And so that in itself is a, a, a DNA component to be able to turn around is one important component of ask if there's a, a better way. The better way might be to go home. Yeah. I mean, the one thread between this book and losing the Nobel Prize is confirmation bias, which is another fancy way of saying, you know, sunk costs. I don't know. Sunk costs is kind of fancy too. But the point being that you get so much invested in in a direction in aviation again, you know, there's a disease called get there itis, which kills, you know, many pilots because they're like, I'll be there, James, at your, you know, at, at, at your party at, at you know, five o'clock sharp on Sunday afternoon and I'll get there and you please meet me. Yeah, you know, like you start to invest, like I'm going to let James down. I'm going to look like a fool. I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm not a good pilot. Blah, blah, blah. And you've got the imposter syndrome, but then it can lead to a real world consequence, not just like, oh, you know, I have to now you know, kind of maybe talk to somebody about my imposter syndrome. It could be like you get killed. Like you force the flight. You don't have enough fuel. You go into a thunderstorm. You hit a mountain. All these things are real world consequences. So I started to think, well, how can you map this into, you know, into physics, into science, but also into, yeah, being a car salesman. Now you're a car salesman. So sometimes the best option for a customer might be to turn them away and say, well, this Camry that James really wants to buy, it's really not that what he needs because he's got five kids. You know, no, 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 we should instead, you know, go for a Suburban. And then when his daughter, like I noticed in your interview with this guy from, you know, Allied Moving, you know, that you did last week, which I found really interesting. I was listening to it with my, uh, one of my kids in the car and he thought it was really super interesting. And it's like, like originally I was like, why is he talking to some guy from Allied Moving? You know, like I used to move in high school, move people, you know, earn some money. Uh, I, most of the guys I, I, you know, was with, I, I probably didn't have that much to uh, to really benefit, except how to like bulk up and carry a refrigerator on my back by myself, uh, which I can no longer do thanks to being 50. But anyway, um, but those guys, like he, he said some things like, we can't compete with some smaller rival. So like he actually said, like I would refer them to like Joe brother, you know, I'll touch your brother's moving company rather than allied because they'll be effectively more nimble. And guess what, James? 
that probably earns him a client or maybe two clients or three clients later on down the road. Just like the car salesman sure. who doesn't force you into a, a Camry, but puts you in, tell, recommends a Suburban. Then your kids, when your daughters can drive, now you send them to him because they don't need a Suburban, right? Yeah. So sometimes the best way forward is, is sort of backwards against your best supposed interest of, you know, that you've sunk so much of your, of your resources into. That was the end of part one of Think Like a Nobel Prize winner. Also available today is part two. So learn the techniques of Nobel Prize winners so maybe you could win one also. The McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits, all designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost Box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last. 